important question. How did you survive? How did you survive? Because in the, in the American newspapers, uh, the war in Vietnam got a lot of uh, bad publicity. The media was against it. The Democrats were against it. The draft dodging, uh, uh, draft card burning, pinko, uh, anti-American, anti-government, insurrectionist, revolutionary, rap brown and his crowd, uh, they, they were all against the war. And the, instead of the, the media spotlighting the heroism of the, boy, I, that, that, just, that just puts a burr under my saddle. I, you know, the boys, the men that went to Vietnam went with the same call, the same desires, the guys that went to World War II. And, and don't, don't stink in, I don't care what you're thinking in your brain right now, because my brain's already outthought your brain, and I'm just saying that because I get in a vibe, a couple of you don't agree with what I'm saying, but I know what I'm talking about, amen. The guys that went to Vietnam said, oh, they all went to Vietnam, they drafted a bunch of black people, drafted a bunch of poor people, drafted a bunch of this. Look, I hate to tell you this, but 82% of the people that went to Vietnam between 1965 and 1970 enlisted. Did you hear what I said? Stop reading your stinking revisionist history books. And stop reading what a bunch of liberal writers put in the, in the uh, editorial pages of the, of the major newspapers. 82% of the men that enlisted in the Army, not the, I don't know about the Marines or the Navy, but 82% of the men that enlisted in the Army, or 82% out of the 100% of men that went, 82% enlisted between 1965 and 1970. Now, I don't know about before 1965. I don't know about after 1970. The enlistment rate, rates dropped way, way, way down because of what the media, how the media portrayed, our, portrayed the war. And not only that, because the, the leadership of the war, uh, Westmoreland and them, they didn't fight the war right. Look, this slap box and stuff, this you slap me, I'll slap you, you slap me, you slap me. No, if, uh, I'll slap you. You slap me, I'm going to hit you 58 times. You pull out a stinking switchblade, I'm going to pull out a, a, a machete. You pull out a 22, i I'm going to say, give me that 12-gauge pump. Here we go. You still want to fight? That's the way I believe in fighting. Did you know you'll get in a lot less fights that way? Did you know you get in a lot less fights if you'd be willing to stand up for what's right? And if America went over there and said, you know what, we're going to bomb you back into the Stone Age, we wouldn't have had the kind of problems we had. But we had learned, listen, listen to me, folks. We had learned after the, the total bloodbath, 40 million people perished in World War II. 40 million. Did you know the world's population at that time was 1.5 billion people? 40 million. Four out of every, what is that, 60? One out of every 15 people that walked the face of the earth perished in that war. Or one out of every 150. The world didn't want to fight a war again. And then when uh, China and North Korea began to attack South Korea, Chris was in that war, we, we ended up having a stalemate. And what is it, 39th parallel, 38th parallel, 39th parallel? We had a stalemate in 54 after, after uh, 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 all the uh, uh, death there. We didn't want to fight again. And we went to Vietnam to help, the, help out the South Vietnamese against the communist aggression in the, in the Southeast, a part of, the, of, of Asia, Americans didn't want to fight again. But the boys that went to Vietnam, I believe, had as much patriotism, as much love for country, as much as I love America, as the boys that went in 1940. And, and the, the Vietnam veterans got this bad rap that they're a bunch of rebellious crowd. But if they enlisted to go to fight a war just like their daddies and their grandpas did, they did it because they loved America the same way. Because a 20-year-old in 1965 was born in 1945, and he grew up in that good generation. Amen. So when Tom Vogel went to war, he asked one of these men, how did you survive? And he said that was the, the paramount thing in his mind. How did you survive? And this guy looked at him and said four words. Here's what he said. Dig in every night. Dig in every night. Brother Vogel said he went with his platoon and it went to the outfit and he, he told all the whole story about it. He said there's a whole bunch of guys who were there. They didn't dig in every night. He said they didn't worry about it. He said every night he would dig in. Every time they went out on patrol, even in their, even in their base camp, you know, he would already have his foxhole. But he'd dig in no matter where. They, he said he didn't matter if, it was, if they were five clicks or five kilometers or if they were 200 yards outside the camp. You wouldn't camp 200 yards away. You'd come back in the camp. But he said no matter where we were, no matter what was going on, no matter how late it is, no matter how tired I was, no matter how thirsty I was or how hungry I was or how much detail I had to pull before we could finally go 
to our, our, our foxhole, he said, I dug in every single night I was in Vietnam. Why? Because I went over, there's a 19-year-old kid, and I saw a man come back that, at age 15 years and 13 months, and he said, how did you survive? And the man said, dig in every night. Tom Vogel said, uh, I never needed it. And a lot of guys made fun of me. And a lot of guys said, man, Vogel, you're wasting your time. And hey, when you get done, Tom, come dig a hole for me. And teased him all the time and teased him. And, it, you know, he's a good, he's a fun-loving guy. I mean, he didn't get bitter or mad at anybody. He'd just go ahead and dig his hole. He didn't just dig a little skinny hole. He dug a regulation foxhole, no matter what the situation was, no matter how hard the ground was. He said, I never needed it until one night when artillery came raining in about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was already in my hole. He said, all of a sudden, I, he said, I had the only hole dug for about six or seven positions. He said, all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, five or six guys were on top of me in that hole, and I was the safest one in Vietnam. Amen? He said, when the, when the artillery was over, the top man was dead. When the, when the barrage was over, the top Marine, who, who he was in the bottom, and guys came running to his position. Why? They knew Vogel had a hole. They knew Vogel dug in. And Vogel dug in every night. How did you survive, Marine? He said, I dug in. Dig in every night. And at the end of that artillery barrage, those mortars busting in. It's not like watching an Audie Murphy movie either. I mean, according to what I've read, I've never heard it. I've never been on artillery range. But you can't even hear yourself think. You can't hear somebody shouting in your ears for 20 minutes. People, I mean, it just, uh, there, there are some artilleries and concussion and percussion uh, uh, explosions over there. You can't hear anything. And uh, maybe some of us would think, oh, man, I'd love to go to war. Pow, 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 pow. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Thank God for men that have went. I don't want to go because I would be afraid. But I know one thing. If I said, how'd you survive? And he said, dig in. Guess what I do every night? If he said, keep your weapon clean. Guess what I do every night? He said, do whatever the master sergeant says. Guess what I do? Whatever the master sergeant says. Because in my uppermost mind, listen to me, folks, is survival. Casualty or fatality. And he said at the end of that artillery barrage, as they pulled the guys, the guys started crawling off of the hole. He said, man, I was the safest one in Vietnam that night, but the top man was dead. Why? He didn't dig in. Now, here in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, Ahab says... Uh, a certain man draws a, a bow and pow, shoots him between, the, between his uh, uh, says joints of his harness, but between his uh, uh, personal armor, shoots him. And he says to his uh, chariot driver, uh, get me out of here. Here's what he says, for I am wounded. Get this, Ahab later dies, and Ahab here in Second Chronicles is officially listed as a casualty. You listen to me? In 1983, uh, uh, Shiite terrorists attacked the Marine barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, and 240 Marines were killed. What did America do? We pulled out of Lebanon. In 1993, uh, it's been made into a movie and books have been written about it in Somalia. We're over there trying to feed people and they want to attack us. Uh, 19 uh, Army helicopter pilots and assorted men were killed. And what did we do? When we suffered 240 fatalities and casualties, we pulled out. In Somalia in 1993, when, hey, sit up, son, son, sit up, sit up. In 1993, when we suffered 19 casualties and fatalities, we pulled out. Now we're 10 years later in the year 2003, we've suffered about uh, 300 casualties and fatalities in Iraq. And thank God we have not pulled out, but we've stayed, amen. Look, folks, because we, it, it, for some reason, when we face casualties, we lose our nerve. But war, listen, folks, war, I hope you're listening tonight. If you're saved, I hope you're listening. War produces casualties. We lost, there were 50,000, and a casualty doesn't, I'm going to get to this in a minute, but a casualty doesn't mean you're dead. A fatality is dead. Casualty could be wounded. We had 50,000 casualties and fatalities at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. There were 23,000 casualties and fatalities in the Civil War at the Creek, Antietam Creek in Maryland. 23,000. There were 9,500 Marines and assort sailors and whatnot. Fatalities and casualties on Okinawa in uh, the Pacific Theater in World War II. There were 2,312 dead and, and uh, many uh, up to 3,500 casualties but 2,300 fatalities in December at the attack by the cowardly Japanese at Pearl Harbor. You say, oh, but, well, oh, pastor, now don't say cowardly because that's not politically correct. Buddy, I don't read revisionist history. Don't believe it. Don't read it. Don't want it revised. I'm just going to read it like I get it. Amen. 
And believe what I read. We lost 872, the largest day of fatalities in Vietnam for American forces, 872 dead in one day in Vietnam. And we had 56,000 at the end of the war in 1973, either dead or missing in action. War produces casualties. Some of you are going to end up casualties. Some of you are going to end up fatalities. Some, listen, folks, some of us in the Christian warfare are going to end up fatalities. Why? Because we don't dig in. We don't dig in. You, you, you know, Tom Vogel is a 19-year-old boy. I would think some of you, you younger people, I would think you have enough sense to ask an older Christian, what do I do to survive? What do I do to survive? Why don't you ask me sometime, preacher, could I talk to you? What do I do to survive the Christian? You've made it 23 years. Uh, you've made it several tours of duty. I made, I guess, at least three tours. I'm working on my third tour right now. Four tours. First tour would have been before I went to college. Second tour would have been college. Third tour would have been out in California. Fourth tour would have been when I came back. And if I was ever going to be a casualty, it would have been when I came back from California before I came here. And I guess I'm working on my fifth tour now, amen. But I survived. And not only have I survived, I'm still firing my piece, amen. Amen. I haven't, I haven't got a ship back to the quartermaster corps yet. I haven't been asked for a transfer back to the being a cook. And, and that's okay. Being a cook. There's nothing wrong with being a cook. But I'm still out there with my peace. I'm still out there manning my weapon in the warfare. It'd be wise if you'd ask somebody that has survived a few tours, how do you survive? You, you might do that. You say, what are you going to tell me? Oh, probably everything I heard from Brother Hiles and J. Frank Norris and John R. Rice and Lee Robertson. You know, Tom Malone, you know what? He was down there preaching Eric Eric Brother, I know you're close to him in your heart. He was preaching for Eric Kapasik. And when he said, when you pick me up at the hospital, he said, when you pick me up at the airport, bring a wheelchair. He said, I can't even walk through the airports anymore. So they pushed him in a wheelchair. And when he, he said, now, when I get to the church, he said, you're going to have to bring me from the hotel in a wheelchair and everything else. But he said, I'm walking down the aisle. He said, I don't push me in a wheelchair down the aisle. So he got up, walked from the back all the way to the front, and he preached 87 years old, going on 88. And Brother Capacic said, Brother Malone, when are you going to retire? And Brother Malone said, I'm never going to retire, son. I'm going to preach till I die. I'm going to preach till I die. You know, that's sort of like Eric Capacic saying to Brother Malone, Brother Malone, how did you survive? And Brother Malone said, I just kept preaching, son. I just kept preaching, son. Now, look, folks, war produces casualties. 50,000 at Gettysburg, 23,000 in Tetum, 9,500 at Okinawa, 2312 at Pearl Harbor, 872 one day, one day in Vietnam, and 56,000 dead and missing total at the end of the war. Let me give you four or five thoughts. Please remember these. Number one, not all casualties are fatalities. Did you get that? If you get wounded in battle, doesn't mean you're dead. Listen to me carefully. If you get wounded in battle, it doesn't mean it's over. Too many people get dinged, and too many people get pinged, and too many people get nicked, and too many people get uh, skin wound, and you think you're dead, so you got to quit church. You think you're wounded beyond all belief. You've been hurt more than anybody else been hurt. I mean, you know what? You haven't been hurt more in a church than other people have been hurt. I guarantee you, you've not been hurt more sometimes than I've been hurt. Sometimes you don't even know when I get hurt because I'm not going to tell you if I'm hurt. You know, God said to the, to the nation of Israel, listen, folks, I'll take care of you and I'll feed you. And he said, let me tell you this. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you because I don't want you to know if I'm weak or not. And there's a lot of times I'm hurt. And there's a lot of times my soul's heavy. And there's a lot of times I'm discouraged. And a lot of times I have a flesh wound or I got a ping or I got a ding or I'm hurt somewhere. But I don't get up and go, oh, I got an owie. Oh, I got an owie. I think I'll quit. Folks, casualty doesn't make you a fatality. Just because you get wounded in battle doesn't make you a fatality. You're not dead yet. Norman Schwarzkopf was warned, uh, wounded uh, uh, pretty severely February 14, 1967 in the Mekong Delta. In it, he wrote, as he wrote his autobiography, here's what Norman Schwarzkopf's autobiography is called. It doesn't take, it didn't take a hero. Didn't take a hero, he said. That was his autobiography. It didn't take a hero. General, uh, well, we don't call him general. Norman Schwarzkopf was uh, uh, a casualty of war. General uh, George Patton was a casualty of war. Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower too, was a casualty in World War I. Colin Powell was injured in the war. They were all wounded, but they were not fatalities. They were casualties, but they were not fatalities. Now get this, and in each case, after they were injured, their greatest days were ahead of them. That's why we say General Schwarzkopf, General Patton, General Eisenhower, General Powell, General Montgomery. They were wounded in the war, but that didn't make them quit. Just because you become a casualty doesn't mean you're a fatality. Are you going to be a casualty or a fatality? Now listen carefully. You are in a Christian warfare. Now you can go, you can go MIA. You can go 
uh, you can go, uh, uh, we used to call it AWOL. What do they call it now? AWOL, away without leave. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is no discharge from this war. You get a discharge when they roll you out there in a pine box, amen? Or cardboard if you didn't invest in the stock market. Uh, just question and answer. Uh, when they roll you out, that's when your battle's over. There is no discharge. Yes, you can run away. Yes, you can run. And sometimes we get shell-shocked, and sometimes we get the horror of war uh, gets to us. But just because you get wounded doesn't make you a fatality. So stop acting like you're dead, and you have to quit when you get wounded. Amen, preacher. Took some speed last night, and it's helped me all day. <clears throat> Schwarzkopf, injured, later became a general. Patton, injured, later became a general. Eisenhower, wounded, later became a general. Powell, wounded, later became a general. Montgomery, wounded, later became a general. General John Pershing of World War I fame, wounded, later became a general. So a casualty doesn't make you a fatality, and in every case, your greatest days can be ahead of you, even if you do get wounded. So number one, not all casualties are fatalities. Number two, sometimes the enemy, in our case, Satan, Sometimes the enemy would rather wound you than kill you. Ahab said, listen, Ahab said, carry me from the battle, for I am wounded. Now, I, know, I don't know this to be true, and I, I wrote this down, and I don't mean to be in any way coarse or hurtful. Some of you guys have been in war. But, I, but a, 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 a soldier that told me, his name's Chris Teff, he told me our motto was when you died in battle, man, it was, it was uh, tag him and bag him. Man, if you're dead, is that right, Chris? You're dead. We ain't got time to hold a funeral for you right now. Man, we love you. We care about you. You could have been my best friend. But, buddy, it's tag them and bag them, and let's go kill somebody that killed them. When, you get, when you're a KIA, killed in action, bag them, tag them. We'll catch you later. We'll get you later. We'll carry you out of here later. But right now, we got a war to fight. So if the devil kills you, you're gone. You're dead. And I don't mean physically, but I mean you spiritually say, oh, I'm wounded spiritually so much, I'm just going to be missing in action the rest of my life. I'm going to be away AWOL. I'm just going to go home and cry and pout, and I'm going to be a big baby. And by the way, don't go join the other stinking camp. Oh, Tired people say, well, I'm wounded. I'm going to go join the other I'm going to go join the other outfit. You don't have a right. To, that is the stupidest thing. Why do Christians think they can violate all the Bible principles? Why do Christians think the United States Army, you can't go join another outfit? Right. I could never say, you know, I'm, I'm tired of my chief. I'm tired of the slop they feed us on this ship. Can I get a witness? I'm tired of being on this boat. I'm tired of this grungy, stinking boat. I'm tired of chips and paint. I'm tired of grinding decks. I'm tired of this. I'm going to go get on another boat. <laughs> it's, it's silly, isn't it? I think I'm just going to go. I don't want to be on the USS Lexington. I want to get on the, uh, I'm going to get on the Eisenhower. I'm going to get on the Abraham Lincoln. That's a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. I don't like being in the submarine corps. I want to be on a, on a destroyer and shoot those big guns. So you just pack your, pack your ditty bag and pack your, pack your uh, what do we call those things? Pack your double bag and say, you know what? I'm going to get me a bus, and I'm going to go up to Norfolk from, from Lexington. I'm going to go across the panhandle of, De of uh, uh, Florida, and I'm going to go from Pensacola to Jacksonville, and I'm going to go over to Jacksonville. I'm just going to walk up to the uh, Danny Clank and go up to the, uh, go up to the quartermaster and say, hey, uh, uh, I'm getting on the quarter deck. I'm going to salute the flag. I'm going to walk on there. I'm going to find the captain and say, hey, captain, I decided to join your ship. <laughs> He's going to say, son, are you? What he's going to say, look, I got time for you. Uh, he's going to call, call the uh, MPs is what he's going to do. He's going to say, take care of this guy. Well, I, just, I didn't like my ship. I want to be on your ship. You can't do that. You can't do that in the military. You can't just say, I don't like being in the Marines anymore. I think I'll go join the Air Force. Well, I don't like being in this division. I don't like my platoon leader, my squad leader, and my drill instructor. Well, that'd be after boot. But I don't like this guy. I think I'll go join someplace else. You can't do that. You have to have orders from headquarters. Tired people just on their own decide to do stuff. Just on their own. You have to have orders from headquarters. You can't just decide that people do it all the time. I'm wounded, so I'm going to leave this platoon and go to another platoon. Hello. Ahab said, carry me from the battle. Buddy, when you're dead, sometimes it's better to be dead than wounded. Because when, when one guy dies, one guy stops fighting. When somebody's wounded, several people stop fighting. 
They put their weapons down, carry the wounded from the battle. Listen, listen to me carefully, folks. You're not going to like what I'm saying. I'm fixing to say it. If you ever decide to backslide and quit church, call me up, cuss me out, threaten my life, tell me you hate my guts, tell me don't ever to come over to your house, and then I'll never come try and babysit you back into the church. Because then I'll just say, you're dead, man. Hello. You're dead. So I'm not going to stop fighting the enemy. I'm not going to stop winning souls. Because in my eyes, you're dead. But when you just fade away and backslide and drift away, you're not dead. You're not a fatality. You're a casualty. You're wounded. And that means I have to stop what I'm doing. And I need to send somebody over to see you. And I need to write you a letter. And I pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray for you. So I say, oh, God, help me win souls. Oh, God, help me win souls. I'm praying, oh, God, help, help Joe to quit being backslidden and get his thinking heart right with God. I'm not having to be spending my time praying for Joe to get right with God. I ought to be spending my time praying for, for me to get people saved. You better believe that's good. So the devil would rather wound you, the enemy would rather wound you sometime than kill you because when you're dead, they just tag them and bag them. But one stops fighting. When you're wounded, several stop fighting. And then they put their weapons down to carry the wounded from the battle. The Viet Cong, filthy communists, anti-God, atheistic communists. By the way, look, look, look. If we would have read on after 2 Chronicles 18, verse 19, chapter 1 says this, chapter 2 says this. Listen, I'm going to read it. If you've got your Bible open, don't turn to it. But chapter 19, verse 1 says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. So he lived through this thing. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah the seer, Jehu was the preacher, he was the preacher's son, went out to meet him went out to meet the king and said to King Jehoshaphat, get this, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Look at me for a minute. That's what I preached about this morning. If God's against it, so are you. Should be. God's for it, so are you. If God's against it, you should be too. And so Jehoshaphat's the king. He comes back in peace and the preacher's son goes out there and he says, what are you doing helping the ungodly? What are you doing helping people that love God? You're supposed to be helping people that hate God. You're supposed to be loving people that don't love God. He said, because you've done this, God takes off with you. Wrath is on you from the Lord. Amen. He'd say, well, brother, we understand. You just made a mistake. He said, you're not supposed to love the ungodly and help them that hate the Lord. Amen. And the Viet Cong, communists, anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-America. I said anti-America. By the way, we trace my roots. My brother's a genealogist. Listen to me. You listening to me? Go find out where you came from. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm Irish-American. Because I'm not Irish-American. I'm American. My brother traced our roots all the way back to 1620 to Culpeper, Virginia, and that's where he stopped. Ran out. He, he's going to send me more all the way back into Europe. But they went from Virginia. Uh, the, my forefathers went from Virginia to Georgia. They stayed in Georgia for a while. Then they went over to Alabama, which is next to Georgia, stayed in Alabama. My dad was born in Alabama. My great-granddad was born in Alabama. My grandfather was born in Alabama. His dad was born in Alabama. His dad was born in Georgia. His dad was born in Georgia. His dad was born in Virginia. Uh, since 1620, the name Jackson has been for 400 years. Jacksons have been in America. I am an American. Amen. Amen. An American. Long may she wait. Say, so, well, I won't salute the flag. Well, don't do it around me, jerk. Well, I don't believe in putting anybody. I'm not putting that above God. Well, if you salute the flag, you're putting the country above God. No, I'm putting my country in the rightful place. God bless America. Tired of people running around saying, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. Find out where you're from, Amen. I tell you what you are. I don't know where you're from, but I'm going to tell you what you are. You're an American. You live in America. Amen, preacher. I'm not talking about you. I know you're Chinese. I'll tell you one thing. If I went to the Philippines and somebody attacked it, I would fight for the Philippines. That's where I live. That's where I'm fighting. I'm going to walk around there. Oh, I'm an American. I'm a Filipino American. I'm a Filipino American. I'm an American. I'm a Mexican American. I'm an American. I talked to some people yesterday. Came from Mexico. I said, well, well, she was born in America, uh, Mexico. The kids were born in Iowa and Texas. I said, well, what nationality are you? She said, we're Americans. 
live right down here on New Haven. Four little kids, five kids. One of them's a baby and the oldest is 13. I said, well, what nationality? And because I was trying to act like I could talk Spanish and stuff and trying to learn Spanish from her. And I said, man, I really admire people who talk Spanish. I wish I could speak Spanish. I could talk to more people, la, la, la. And I said, well, where, where are you from? She said, well, I was born in Mexico. And I said, well, how about all the, the kids? And she said, well, they're Americans. Amen. I told them, hey, that's something to be proud of. I said, but now if you're from Mexico, that's something to be proud of too. If you're Mexican, be proud of being Mexican. If you're Filipino, be proud of Chinese, be proud of being Chinese. <laughs> but the Viet Cong, atheistic, dirty dogs, would take spent AK-47 shells, were about two inches, about inch and three, about two inches tall, and they would put them in the ground, bury them in the ground, and then in the ground they'd put punji sticks inside those AK-47 shells, and on those shells they'd put human waste, fetid human waste, and poison, and that would cause a serious infection when you stepped on that punji stick. It would set up gangrene quickly, and the VC knew from studying the ways of Stalin and Hitler and Mao Zedong that wounded men hurt morale. Wounded men hurt morale. Listen to me, folks. The Bible says a wounded spirit who can bear. So if you become a casualty, you're not a fatality, and you better keep fighting. And don't sit around and be wounded, and don't make 15 people come over and baby you all the time. You know, I like Mrs. Seifert, and I'm not going to say why, but there's something happened two or three weeks ago. And she said, you know what, something happened. She said, you ticked me off. I'm glad she said it, because it ticked me off too, but I was trying to be politically correct. But in my heart, I feel the same way she did, exactly how she felt. I said, you know what, Mrs. Seifert, I feel exactly how you feel. Amen. Because wounded people hurt morale. Folks, listen to me. Listen to me. Boy, I don't know how else to say it, and I wish I was much more broader, broader, but I feel like I try to have a PhD in church management. Why are you doing that? Because wounded people hurt morale. And you're wounded, and I come to you to say, look, you're wounded. I'm not wounded, or I'm wounded because of you, or I If you're not a fatality and you're not dead and you just got a little flesh wound but you're blown up into a big thing you are going to hurt morale. Thank you pastor. Glad you study this stuff. Number three. Remember three. Number one. What was number one? Number one was talking about uh, number one not all casualties are fatalities. Number two sometimes the enemy would rather wound you than kill you. Did you get that? It, 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 hopefully I'm not just shouting and you're not getting it. But sometimes the enemy would rather wound you than kill you. Folks that's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 wear the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God so you don't get wounded all the time. But babies. Baby Christians. Whining Christians. Wee 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 wee. Wounded people all the time. And wounded people affect morale. And you know when you get a wound and you don't get it fixed and you step on one of those punji sticks, if you were out in the field somewhere and you, out in the bush and you didn't get that thing fixed, you know gangrene would set up, an infection would set up. You couldn't walk. You'd have to be carried by three or four men. Four men would have to shoulder their, shoulder their, their uh, arms and shoulder their piece and, and carry a wounded man because he couldn't walk. Five men out of commission because one guy got wounded and didn't get it fixed. Huh. Number three, remember, you too can be a casualty. Remember, you too can be a casualty. Drugs can get you. Alcohol can get you. Bad women can get you. Bad men can get you. Bad friends can get you. Bad teenagers can get you. Solomon was gotten. Samson was gotten. King Saul was gotten. Ahithophel was gotten. Demas was gotten. All of them became casualties, and some of them became fatalities. Luke 22, verse 31, the Bible says Peter uh, was there, and Christ was speaking to him. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Listen, folks, listen very carefully. Here's the thing. Satan knew Peter had potential for the battle of good and evil. And he wanted to wound him, sift him, and he did wound him too. And after he was wounded, several disciples followed Simon back to the boat. If you have any potential to do something for God, 
If you're a soldier in a battle, they aim, they aim for the generals. They want to shoot the officers. Listen carefully. If you're a father, the devil's got you in his, got you in his uh, sights. If you're a Sunday school teacher, the devil's got you in his sights. Brother Will, the devil has got you in his sights. Brother Chris, well, you've been shot already. Brother Chris, the devil has you. You know who's the most, listen, you know who is the most, who I fear for the most in this church besides, I would say, my wife and myself? Abe Guzman. Because the devil knows he's supposed to be a preacher. The devil was watching, some demon somewhere was watching when Abe got called, when Abe made a public profession or when whatever Abe did, I don't remember exactly, if he went forward in a high school chapel, if he told his dad after church, if he told Dr. Hiles or Brother Eddie, I don't know, Brother Eddie Lapina, I don't know who he told, but, but everybody knows that he's supposed to be a preacher, and he is a preacher, and God knows it, and the devil knows it, and the devil wants to take you out. Don't get too hard on preachers that fall, because they got a big old target on them. Don't get too judgmental of Peter for falling here. He had a big old target. The, the, Jesus didn't come and call, a, a, oh, I don't know, Judas the son of Alphaeus over and say, uh, Judas, uh, uh, the devil has desired to have you. The devil wasn't worried about Judas Alphaeus. He wasn't so much worried about Thomas. He said, I'm after Peter. He said, Jesus said, Peter, Thomas, is at, uh, uh, the devil's after you because he said, if, I, if he, he knows if he can get you, a whole bunch of you are going to follow. And a whole bunch of them did follow him, and they were all out in a boat fishing, weren't they? Hello? Buddy, you listen to me, Sunday school teachers. Listen to me, dads. Shut that door back there, Brother Rick. Make sure it's shut and shut the nursery doors too. Uh, uh, the, listen to me, listen to me. But turn around, turn around. Devil's after you, Dad. Devil's after you, Brother Abe. Devil's after you, Sunday school teacher. The devil's after you, pulpit committee guys. The devil's after you. Are you workers and are you helpers? The devil's after you, bus captains. The devil's after you. He's got his sights on you. The devil's after you, teenager. The devil's after you, mom, trying to rear that child by yourself. The devil gets you, he gets junior. The devil gets you, he's got junior. He gets two for one. Say, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you. Look, folks, the Bible says uh, the demon said to Brother Paul in the book of Acts, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And if the devil knows who you are, watch out. Because in a battle, he's shooting at you. Number four, real quick. Uh, uh, sometimes, listen, and I'll be quick on four and five and six. Sometimes we produce casualties as a result of friendly fire. Sometimes casualties are produced as a result of friendly fire. Saul, here he, here he was on the same uh, uh, army, the same platoon as David. He told David, you can't go fight Goliath. You're not able. He was well-meaning Christian. Sometimes well-meaning Christians will produce a casualty. I, 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 I say this enough to not repeat it and be too re repetitive about it, but when I came here, there were well-meaning, some were well-meaning, I'm not sure about everybody, but a few well-meaning men said, I would not start a church in Fort Wayne. I would not start a church in Fort Wayne. I had one man that came to this church, was about 20 years older than me, and he came here for a long time. He had some kids that were a lot older than my kids, and he used to tell me all the time everything I was doing wrong. Now, I think he was, well, I'm not going to tell you his name, but I think he was well-meaning. But do you know he was wounding me every time he did that? Now, I did not let him know he was wounding me. I did not tell him he was, by the way, he, he left and his kids all went to the devil too. Not amen, not good that that happened to his kids. I'm simply saying he kept telling me he was wounded me. I'm glad I didn't listen to him. Of course, there was a deacon the first time. Has anybody ever heard the title of Brother Hiles? You, should, you might know this. Well, does anybody know the title of Brother Hiles' first sermon? It was called, Boy, It Sure Is Hot In Here. Yeah, you get that? His first sermon was called, Boy, It Sure Is Hot In Here. Well, Hiles tells the story. The first time he ever preached, he was... Uh, he, he said he was called to preach, and a few weeks later, somebody asked him to preach, and he'd said, you know, he'd heard his pastor get up and pray and, and say, oh, God, you know, I fill my mouth with the words you want me to say. Oh, God, put the words in my heart. So Brother Howes didn't know you're supposed to get a sermon or an outline or study or even get a verse. He didn't know anything. He just thought, you just got up there, and all of a sudden, God put the words in your mouth. So the first time he got up to preach, he didn't, he, that's what he thought. He said he got up there and he said, man, God sure let him down. Didn't put anything in his mouth, you know. And all he could think of as to say was, boy, it sure is hot in here tonight. He said he preached about two or three minutes and stammered and stuttered and finally apologized to the people and said, folks, I'm sorry. I just, I, 
I just thought I had something to say, but I guess I don't. And he sat down and later, listen, sometimes casualties are produced as a result of friendly fire. A well-meaning older man in the church, a deacon, came up to him and he said, Son, let me give you some advice. Don't be a preacher. Be a carpenter. Be a plumber. Be an electrician. Be an accountant. But son, don't be a preacher. Good thing Brother Howell didn't listen. Greatest preacher, I mean, probably around for the last 50 years. Uh, Brother Hiles, it's a good thing he didn't listen. Listen, folks, listen to me. Well-meaning Christians sometimes produce casualties. Be careful what you say to people. Be careful you don't run people down. Be careful. Somebody walked out today, and, and, and they said uh, something about, they said, you know, I probably got to apply that in my soul, and I'm probably not being forceful enough. And I said to that guy, instead of me saying, yeah, that's true, that's exactly what you need to do, I said, no, 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 no. You keep going. You keep being faithful. If you get two a year, five a year, ten a year, fifty a year, you keep going. You keep being faithful. You'll see people saved all the time. You're doing good. I'm not about to say, yep, that's right. That's what you got to do. Because then when that guy goes soul, and he goes soul in just about every week in the world, then when he goes soul in, he's going to be all tensed up and maybe I, now wait a minute if the Holy Spirit said that to him I don't know if the Holy Spirit said to his heart look you got to push you know you got to pop the question more with people then that's okay if that's what the Lord told him to do then that's what he ought to do but I'm not about to tell somebody uh, uh, yeah that's right you, you, you got to get straightened out you got I'm not going to tell any of these guys to say they're preachers they're not preachers you know somebody says pray for Seth he's going to go for the tour group you know what I've been doing saying I've been going back to my room going ha 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 Seth in the tour group no that's not what I've been saying you know what I've been saying hey man I'm going to pray for Seth make the Seth makes his tour group and I've been saying to Ben, man, I hope Seth makes the tour group. And I've been saying to Sarah, Sarah, when you go to Howells Anderson College, maybe you should go out for the tour group. And, and you know what? I've been, I'd rather push people to do good. Push them to do good. Don't you be an inflictor of wounds because of friendly fire. Number five, I'll say this, and then six, and I'm done. Number five, take every precaution to stop. I take every precaution to, to I take every precaution to stop and to prevent casualties at the church. Folks, that's why I preach like I do. You listen to me? That's why I have teenagers stand up. That's why I talk about living right. That's why I talk. That's why I say what I say to Brother Abe. You say, well, you don't, Brother Abe probably doesn't like getting put on the spot. I can't help if Brother Abe likes getting put on. He doesn't. He doesn't like attention. I know that about him. He's like, leave me alone. I'll do my thing, but don't bring attention to me. But I want to say that to him because I want him to remember that. I want to go home tonight, and I want his wife to hear that. I want his wife to say, you know what? My husband is under, going to be under severe attack by the devil. It's going to help her pray. It's going to help you treat the kids better. It's going to, hey, look, folks, we need to be honest. Amen. That's why, I mean, I'll rag on some of you guys. I'll ride some of you teenagers. I get mad at some of you sometime, and I'll tell you what I think. And I'll get on Lipford, and I'll get on Murphy, and I'll, I'll get on some of you, and I'll talk about being a soul winner, and I'll talk about being faithful, and, and shut off that Internet, and put that magazine away, and stop you fighting with your wife all the time. Stop you cussing in the house. Get that alcohol out of the house. You say, boy, you're just in a bad mood. No, I'm trying to prevent casualties. Every possible precaution to stop or prevent a casualty. And then lastly, let me say this, and I'm done. You take every possible precaution to keep from becoming a casualty or a fatality. By the way, could I say this? We live in this country where it's like it's real popular to have girlfriends, right? We got 12-year-olds and 10-year-olds running around with their midriff showing. Amen. We got, we've got this kind of a, for some reason we have, it's not some reason, it's the devil knows how to destroy our country. We have glorified sex. We have glorified and magnified the human body. Uh, we have taken something that is holy and pure and delightful and special and intimate between a man and a woman in a marriage, the bonds of matrimony that God ordained in the Garden of Eden in a special way, and we have turned it into a wicked cesspool in America. And so you've got all these little girls running around. Who's I talking to? Was it Dan? No. Who's I with the other day? I was with John. I was talking about how, John Lemming, and I was talking about how when I was a certain age, listen folks, I didn't want a girlfriend. I don't want to kiss a girl. I don't want to kiss no girl when I was 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do the dirty deed. I wanted to stay a virgin until I was married. But you know all my friends kept teasing me and 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 teasing me and, teasing me and pushing me and pushing me and saying, what are you, fag? What are you, homo? And 
until my peer pressure group broke me. And that's why, you listen carefully, folks, that's why here, I don't want you to date until you're out of high school. I, you know, Ben, he's stupid. He thinks he's in love. I said, listen to me, Ben. Listen to me, Lisa. Don't say that. Don't write that in notes. Don't write that in letters. We read your letter, too, sealed with a kiss. You were busted in front of everybody. You say, why, preacher? Are you some kind of prudish kind of guy? No, because when you're 13 or 14 and you say, I love you, well, where do we go from there? Some type of physical contact. And then where do we go from the holding hands and kissing? Then we put our hands where we ought not put our hands. Then we take off our clothes. And I'm being pretty frank tonight, but I'm telling you folks, you listen carefully, do not. That's why I preach like I do. You say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, about 10 times as much as you think you know. Take every precaution to prevent yourself from being a casualty. So I said, Ben, when you're ready, if you ever decide to marry Lisa, I shouldn't even be talking like this. I know I shouldn't. But if you ever decide to, that's when you tell her you love her. And then you set a date, you know, four or five years out in the future. You're both 30, you know. That's what I personally think. Then you're smart enough to know how to raise kids and stuff and, and, and pay your bills off. And then you do that. Then you have a natural progression. And that's why I don't want, that's, listen to me, that's why I don't want you. Are you paying attention, girls and guys? That's why I don't want you 13 and 14-year-old and 15-year-old guys and girls going steady. You can't go anywhere with it. Where are you going to go? You're not just going to go steady for five years. What you're going to do is break up, and I believe this with all my heart. I believe a 13 or 14 or 15-year-old can have the same emotion as love. You cannot have the depth of love that a 30 or 40-year-old person can have, but you can have love. And so you can be 15 years old, and I mean you are in love with that boy, or you are in love with that girl, and you're not prepared for it, and then you break up, it's like going through the trauma of divorce. I, do you, do, don't we wonder why so many high school kids commit suicide? I mean, it happens all the time. Suicide is an epidemic. You know why? Because the glorification of sex. Got to have a boyfriend, can't be a virgin. Got to have a girlfriend. And most guys will do what they should not do. And then you get pregnant. Oh, yeah, I'll be around. Let's see if they're around two or three years from now. You just check it out and see how many ladies are raising their kids by themselves because the guy didn't hang around and do the right thing. He's willing to do the wrong thing, but now he doesn't want to do the right thing. You listen to me? You take every possible precaution to keep you from being a casualty. I give you four things to do, and then you do it. Number one, dig in. Where to dig in? Dig in your Bible. Tom Vogel said, how would you survive your tour? And this 21-year-old man that looked 35 that at age 15 years and 13 months said, dig in every night. Are you listening to me? Dig in your Bible every night, day, every day. Dig in your Bible every day. Dig in your prayer life every day. Dig in with church attendance and dig in with fellowship. Those four things will make it. So who should I fellowship with? How about this? Hang around a veteran. Amen. But if I was going to Iraq tomorrow, I'd try and find out the guy that's been there longest, that was the smartest, and I'd say, I'm hanging around you. Now, I know war, you could be in the right and smart and everything else and still get take a, take a bullet somewhere, but I'd want to get around the veteran. I'd hang around the rookie. He doesn't know anything. I want to get around a veteran and hang around a veteran. You young Christians, you teens, why don't you hang around a veteran? Why don't you find somebody that's made it a tour or two and say, man, how are you making it? Hang around a veteran. You know, Paul, the Bible says in Corinthians, Paul said, here's what Paul said, and I'm, close, I'm done. Paul said, I keep under my body daily. Not monthly or weekly, daily. Why? Lest I also should be a castaway. Paul had been preaching 25 years, amen? You know, Brother Howell, he just quit reading his Bible the last 10 years of his life, didn't he? He just said, man, I've been reading my Bible. I've been reading it for 65 years. I might as well quit reading my Bible. No, Brother Howell's probably studied his Bible more at the end of his life than he did early in his life. And the older you get, the more you should dig in. Paul, been preaching 25 years, 
not going to sleep, are you? Paul, been preaching 25 years, here's what he said. I keep under my body daily, lest I too should be a castaway. Now, Paul could think that. It could happen to us, couldn't it? Casualties or fatalities? Hope you got something out of this message tonight to help you be a survivor. Let's pray. Father.